You are listening to the e-commerce marketing school presented by Privy and Triple Whale. I'm your host, Val Geisler. Joe, thanks for being with us on the e-commerce marketing school today. I am so excited that you are here. Uh, we have known each other for a few years uh, through our past lives uh, on the on the uh, tech side, on the SaaS side of the e-commerce world, and we are both on the brand side. And you had this really amazing split when you were um, on the SaaS side, is that you were actually a brand operator. Uh, as a bit of a side hustle, but probably felt like two full-time jobs. Um, and uh, I'm really glad that we're connecting because one of the topics that uh, we talked about back then and that we are going to talk about today is advertising without advertising, right? So unpaid marketing. And uh, you have a very unique perspective on this. Um, and I think... W- working in an industry with a quote like taboo product. So there's a lot of products that fall under this category that just cannot um, get past like regulations on advertising. You know, I hear from brands on the non-taboo side who are like, uh, I don't know how I, we have to do paid. Like there's no other way to acquire customers. I have to invest money into paid ads. Um, it's just not true and you are proof of that. So I I would love to have get your take uh to kind of kick us off on what can you just kind of do a little myth buster on whether that's true or not. I know I I feel like it's not true that you have to run paid ads to be a successful e-commerce brand. Um and I would love to hear your take on that. Yeah, well, yeah, first off, thanks for having me. This is one of my yeah. favorite e-com podcasts. Yay. And, um, you know, I definitely didn't come into this discovery of, you know, not being able to run paid ads on all the channels you expect, like Meta and Twitter and Google. And I kind of fell into it by accident. I started a sexual wellness brand and, you know, very quickly realized I couldn't get any ad approved if I was, you know, (laughs) selling products, you know, geared towards self-pleasure. Um, so my, you know, my initial strategy of, you know, how do I get the word out? Um, and I think this is something that like Seth Godin talks about in Purple Cow is like creating a remarkable product that kind of just tells its own story and spreads word of mouth. And, um, so that was like kind of the first step. Um, I was like, let me create, I always created products that were like, how do I create an astonishing product? Like people won't be able to help but talk about it. Um, so that was well, kind of Well, you definitely the first did step. that with Emoji Bader. I feel like yes. there's, uh, it's a great conversation starter. Um, and the name sells itself. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, brand name is, as you know, important. You want it to kind of tell the story of what the product is. Um, and I, you know, first thing I did is coming from, actually, I was, I was a professional musician for, you know, pretty much that's the reason I started an e-com business, right? I was traveling and I needed to make money. And I was like, oh, like I, I know marketing. I know, you know, I know Shopify. Like, let me build a one product brand and, and get it out there. So I knew, um, you know, press was going to be a big strategy for me. And I hustled that in the beginning as if I was hustling sales. So creating relationships with journalists, um, not again, not paid press, not paid placements, but organic placements this is a story and you should write about it because your readers care about this. Um, and that was kind of the philosophy I took throughout my whole marketing. It's like, how do you create stories through your marketing and use that as a vessel to tell a narrative that carries your product through your customers' lives? And so uh, there's a lot of ways you can approach kind of organic um, ads. I mean, they're not it's not ads, but it is ads. Uh, and so I think a lot of people just think about organic social. Well, we just have to post on our uh, personal channels all the time. And lately, more people think about like organic influencer placement, um, not necessarily asking them to do anything or having a paid relationship. Um, but, you know, I, 
I would love to hear about kind of some of the non-traditional ways. So building relationships with yeah. journalists and getting them to write a piece on it is really cool. Um, I don't think enough e-commerce brands are doing that. And there's so many opportunities. Uh, it depends, especially in, in a niche industry, there are publications that you can reach out to and uh, journalists who write on your topic. In your case, like the topic of sexual wellness, there are plenty of blogs and websites where uh, people are writing about it all the time. Um, so what are some other ways besides like just your kind of basic organic social? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we also did stuff that I would call like guerrilla marketing. And that could be like, that could be a partnership that was like really exciting. So for example, one thing that we did that ended up being written about in Rolling Stone and also helped us acquire emails and phone numbers was we actually gave away vibrators um, in response to um, basically like anti-abortion laws and, you know, overturn of Roe versus Wade. And we sent them to Texas, really primarily Texas. We sent one to Ted Cruz's office. We sent one to Governor Greg Abbott's office. And these were people that were just, you know, you could send a free vibrator to anyone. And yes, there was the cost of the inventory. But besides that, there was no real cost of setting this up. And, you know, again, we put into a press release, we got it to Rolling Stone. And it was also a great, now it was a great brand story. It was authentic to the brand. It was genuine to the brand. Um, and like, I have a bunch of other ideas, you know, about guerrilla marketing, doing stuff, you know, in the middle of New York City and, you know, something that gets attention. Um, and you could invite influencers to that and they can, you know, tape it and put it on their socials right in the yeah. moment. And like, that's the kind of like, I, I try and like, how do I create a moment out of my marketing? It's what I go for. The giveaway was really interesting because um, it not only was something that you were giving away, like, kind of, you know, a flat amount um, of product, but you were actually engaging your customers in it um, and doing like a little bit of a one for one, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, we, well, you could, you know, you choose who you're sending it to. Yeah. You're, we're sending them, we're sending them information on what's actually happening. And then we're re-engaging them through email and SMS funnels to, you know, retarget them for future purchases. Yeah. So acquisition tool, in addition to a little bit of uh, press and eyes on the product. I, and also I feel like the cost of the product and shipping for however many you sent was probably less than you would have spent on ads at the time. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, it, well, one, it was predictable. We knew exactly how much each one was going to cost. Sure. And, and two, yeah, it was probably the less, it was, it was definitely less than what our, um, AOB was. So we knew if we could, you know, convert, you know, a certain percentage of those people into, Life to high lifetime value customers because yeah. they had a great first experience with the brand. It was worth it. So their friend or someone they knew sent that essentially sent it to them through you, right? Um, and then they, because of that, kind of become a customer. Did you? What was the process for acquiring them as actual customers once the shipment was sent? Yeah, so I was primarily using email. Um, so maybe like a 10 step email, slightly different than a regular welcome series. Cause I knew exactly where they came in from. Um, and I, you know, my brand is always focused on education. That's been kind of another, you could call it a channel because content marketing and partnerships that align with an education or mission driven brand, um, will also, you know, drive attention. Um, and we would send them down our regular welcome series sort of offers 10% off, et cetera. And then we would also give them also the experience of like a post purchase. So you had this experience with the brand. Now, how do we win you back? How do we get you engaged with the brand? Um, what did you, you know, what was your reaction? Ask, asking for feedback. One of my favorite, um, emails that I used and I used this in the funnel too was a plain text email introducing myself and 
you know, asking what they thought of this and, you know, if they would do it again, if the opportunity arose. Mm -hmm. And those people who were gifted, did they get any kind of, you said you like told them about what was coming or uh, maybe once it got there, what it was, uh, and why why it was on their doorstep. Uh, was there an opt-in at that point for them to continue to hear from you, or how did that work? We sent a postcard with the website. We didn't, you know, we didn't do particularly an opt-in, but we did have a branded postcard that told them, like, basically, you know, we are. Uh, we partnered with an activist group to, you know, fight these unfair anti-abortion laws. And, uh, you know, this person sent it to you. So either either they sent it to you because you support it or they sent it to you because, you know, you're helping fight these laws. Right. Right. So you could uh, choose that in the checkout process when you were gifting. Yeah. 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 We, we um, had, you know, you know, go yourself or... Uh, <laughs> Right. Or, you know, sell good vibes, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, cool. And you got Rolling Stone Press? We got Rolling Stone Press about it, which was a really big hit. And yeah. again, you know, looking later at Google Analytics, it was driving real revenue because we did, we had a feel good moment. Yeah. Yeah. And then how did you leverage that? So I, a lot, I think a lot of brands think about like, okay, Um, you know, I've talked with like Shark Tank brands and that's a blip. I mean, it's a big blip, but it's a blip. And then you have to continue to leverage it. So what other things have you done since that Rolling Stone moment? We did another kind of educational sort of activist uh, video. And that was with an influencer. Her name is uh, Marley Liss. And she did um basically a pleasure focused lesson for survivors of sexual trauma Mm -hmm. and this was like a consumer base that i had no idea we could reach until i started getting all this customer feedback and it was like kind of adding up and adding up and adding up and i realized i could help you know survivors rediscover pleasure after sexual trauma um it you know it fit in terms of like activation. Um, I think, I think what I did with the Rolling Stone piece to answer your question is I did include that in um, our brand story. So if I'm pitching mm. a large wholesale customer, there was a dedicated slide. It actually had this one and the survivor of sexual trauma story because I felt like those are really meaningful. Yeah. Um, and we also included it, you know, in in our email flows of you know, hey, we've done this. We sent we sent a thousand vibrators to anti-abortion states. Rolling Stone wrote about it. It's real. It's legitimate. So, so it gives you a kind of piece of marketing, a uh, piece of collateral that you could use later. Yeah. So it's really tapping into the mission behind the brand and um, some of those elements that might not come kind of right away when you think about marketing, but really thinking, I mean, influencer campaigns are often very successful, particularly uh, when they are unpaid relationships. Um, But uh, I know a lot of people do like seeding to influencers too. So uh, did you do any like sends of product directly to influencers with no expectation on it? As as part of that campaign or in general? Or just in general, have you you played around with that? Yeah. So, I mean, what I, what I'd say is micro influencers because, yeah. you know, a lot of the paying for them, you know, you'd never know if it's going to be a hit or not, if it's right. more risky. Um, so something that I did recently is like, okay, 2023, we want to get, you know, X many reviews this year. So I did a gifting campaign. I, you know, I had my database of people we worked with over the years focusing, um, I basically separated by vertical. So going after, you know, educators, people in the sexual wellness space, um, then we said, um, okay, maybe like actors won't want to post about this, but musicians will. So we went after uh, a lot of female musicians. Um, and then kind of the last one was, uh, I would call meme style accounts. So like, 
Uh, and, and that one was successful because they often have a lot of followers and they don't get asked like this. Um, so that, so that one worked too. And I, I basically said like, you know, bulleted one, two, three, um, like I want to, you know, I think I did this around Valentine's day this year, you know, happy Valentine's day. We want to, we want to give you the gift of pleasure. Um, just let me know your best shipping address. You do not, you know, you do not need to post about it, but we would really appreciate it if you did. Um, you know, you do not need to leave a review, but we'd really appreciate you if you did. And if you enjoy our products, just let us know. And a lot of people, did, I think more people did it because it was, um, you know, we were we were gifting first. We were they, yeah. they wanted to reciprocate the gift. You also used a little bit of like reverse psychology there, right? Like, uh, don't do this. But if you want to, you can uh, tell them what not to and do it, and, and they'll worked. do that. I don't know the percentage, but, you know, anecdotally, it was more than half, if Amazing. not, you know, 80, 90 percent of the people we sent gifts to or, or, you know, the ones that responded, they did end up leaving a review. And, and and that's what I end up doing now. Like if anyone asks for, you know, hey, we want to do a contest or hey, we want to I was like happy to leave a review because reviews are very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. They um, they're good SEO juice, too. Uh, reviews are content on your website uh, with keywords that your customers are searching with anyways it's like voice of voice of customer right there in reviews and it's like the it's best fo- you can screenshot reviews and throw them in emails and you can if you can run ads you can run ads with reviews um so you know there's lots of things you can do uh with those reviews once they're there i what i think is um most impressive is that this brand that can't run ads that can't do any paid marketing uh, was recently acquired by a pretty big brand, uh, and I think that that's like the best possible success story. Thank you. Yeah, we're 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 technically not using the word acquired. We're using bought, but but Emoji Bader is now part of Dame's brand portfolio. Still, will be the Emoji Bader brand, and we felt like Emoji Bader's mission to basically make pleasure accessible to everyone aligned with Dame's mission, which is, you know, make pleasure accessible, close the pleasure gap. Yeah. And Emojibator had a really, you know, different way of going about that using humor. And, uh, and you know, Alex at Dame saw the advantage of being able to talk to a different customer base, maybe a slightly younger customer base mm-hmm. um, and with a slightly lower price point slightly lower cost of entry into this category and like what i was trying to do was create a brand that i could say is the best introduction to sexual wellness um and i think alex is also trying to do that too yeah um and you know so it's a, it really it just made sense to uh to to kind of roll up these yeah. brands and i think you know all these unpaid channels is like that's that's really been like my secret i mean the company was bootstrapped i know ne- like even if i wanted to spend 100 year on facebook ads i would have never done that i couldn't have you know pushed the gas as you know hard as i could on ads and i it forced me to be creative and you know just try things it's not always gonna work yeah dip your toes in and you know it's like the influencers or partnerships they're not all going to be winners but when you do find one, you can start to like put more resources into it and make it as big and make, turn it into marketing collateral. Yeah. You know, for a lot of brand operators, some of the concepts that we talk about in this show are they're very big and broad. And I I love the idea of kind of creating a box that you play in, right? Like create a, a workspace for yourself. And so for you, it was like, hey, I can't I can't spend a ton of money and I can't do paid. Um, so what am I going to do? And that's where you get creative and some of your best results come through the door. I mean, at, at SAS, I worked for a long time ago. Uh, we had this challenge of what if we turned off all new customer acquisition? How would we continue to grow? Um, and it was, you know, activating existing customers and helping them grow their businesses. And then in the SaaS pricing model, that helps you grow. Uh, so, you know, but getting really creative, like create those boxes for yourself, even if you have unlimited budget, can run ads all day long if you want to. Um, you're, you know, you're backed by your 
rich parents or VCs or whoever it is, um, you know, or you've saved up for years and you have money to spend. That's great. Create a little bit of a boundary for yourself in that. And even if it's like for a month or for a quarter, try it. Um, because some of the things that you're talking about, uh, t- they take a little bit of extra work. But gosh, running ads takes work too. So I'd much rather go talk to people than sit behind a screen, like uh, screaming at the meta ad portal. Like that's nobody wants to do that. And with ads, you know, everyone's thinking about, you know, how do I, you know, decrease my CAC and how do I increase revenue by, you know, whatever it is, 10% or something. Yeah. But some of these ideas where, you know, you're thinking about a, bigger picture thing, something that could really wa- run wild. It's like, oh, like, how do I increase my revenue this month by 100% because I did this wild idea and I went for something big and, you know, maybe we'll maybe we'll fall flat on our face and fail, but or maybe we'll double revenue this month because we went for something big and we'll acquire all these new customers. Amazing. I mean, yeah, it's like you create the boundaries and then you get to have a lot more fun. And your percentages that you're working towards are a lot bigger too. So that's always good. It's a little it's a little bit of luck and a little bit of skill, but you know, you throw things at the wall and see what sticks. Totally get it. Joe, thank you for talking with us today, teaching us everything you know about uh, unpaid marketing. Um, if people want to talk to you more, how can they find you? Uh, my LinkedIn, Joe Vela. Um, my Twitter is JV Beats. It's a great place to find me. Awesome. Amazing. Thank you for being here. Appreciate you. And we'll talk to you all soon. All right, class, make sure you're subscribed to e-commerce marketing school and huge favor. If you hear an episode you love, please take two minutes to leave a review with Privy. Anyone can be a marketer, simple, intuitive email and SMS marketing that drives real results without the complexity. And before I go, a special shout out to triple whale e-commerce marketing school is now part of the triple whale podcast network. Triple Whale helps you easily manage and automate analytics, attribution, merchandising, forecasting, and more in the palm of your hand. Check them out by scheduling a demo today.